This is not my first Leica rangefinder. My first rangefinder was the M8. So this is quite an upgrade for me. As much as I loved using the little Sony RX1, the reality is I felt myself getting lazy towards the act of photography, right? I found myself really leaning into the autofocus. I found myself really leaning into the fact that it's 42 megapixels and being like, nah, it's okay. I don't need to get closer, whatever. It, I'll just crop it in post. The resolution is insane. You know, and I even talked about in that review, having a love-hate relationship with that camera. My diehards here on the channel, they know I'm a bit of a purist. I didn't feel good knowing or feeling like the camera was doing a third of my job for me, <laughs> you know, like, and that's fine. We all need the tools, right? But for me, what I do, just like lifestyle, portraits, street, I don't need all the bells and whistles like that. Because the whole time I had the Sony, I would have much preferred to be shooting on the M8. It just, man, it just, it's a very limited camera because it's very old, right? Now you would say, dude, if you really don't want all the bells and whistles, just shoot on film. So <laughs> I actually did pick this up a couple weeks ago. This is the M6. I know I'm all in, man. I'm in the vortex. Oh my God. I've literally had people unsubscribing to my channel. I've had people reaching out to me, going out of their way to let me know that they don't appreciate how I'm you know, doing all these videos on photography lately. And why don't I do more videos on cinematography? I felt I've done a pretty good job of splitting it up, but also I did a response to that. A film, a moving picture, is 24 frames in a second. So if you can't take one photograph, if you don't know how to capture one still image, what makes you think you can take 24 of them in a second? What? I don't quite think a lot of people understand what they're doing, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm in the rabbit hole now, guys. We'll talk about that because the reason why the title is The Way is because there are some big changes coming to Dog Times Productions and me and everything in my life. Uh, so we'll save that for the end. I do want to get through this review. So this is where we are. This is how I came to getting rid of both the M8 and the RX1R Mark II and now living with the M10. So this is my 30 day review of this camera. My first pro that I wanna talk about this camera is kind of just in terms of why I prefer a Leica rangefinder over any digital mirrorless camera. The reason why I have to wear these glasses is because I have a really crazy stigmatism in my eye. Anytime I look at screens, like a computer screen, cell phone screen, an LCD screen on a camera, even the little EVFs, they vibrate. So I have this weird stigmatism in my eyeballs and the brighter the screen is, the worse the vibration is. And I guess I just got used to it. And maybe there was some part of my brain that was either in denial or was just like, oh yeah, that's just what screens do, they vibrate. But as soon as I put the glasses on, they stop vibrating. So that's a weird thing I have in my eyes on top of the hue deficiency. So if you're new here, that's another thing that's wrong with me. I have a, a, a wicked red green colorblind. <laughs> so my eyes are kind of fucked up. That I think is the real reason why I just prefer using a rangefinder is because I can just look through the window and I don't have to rely on a screen at all. And if you know me from the M8, I've always done this. I did this with the M8. Now I did it with the M10 too. I cover up the screens, but that's just more of how I like to shoot. I don't like to chimp when I'm shooting. Anytime I use the rangefinder, I don't need to wear my glasses. I just love it because I'm not looking at a screen. I'm just looking through a little window. I want to talk about why I feel like focusing on a rangefinder is easier for me beyond just the stigmatism with the eye. Let me throw a lens on for this demonstration. The 21 L Merit, this is a big boy. Focusing like this with the manual focusing tab, the way the M lenses are designed, and it's not just the Leica M lenses, they have this cool little focusing mechanism here, the little tab, and I don't know, I just find it so much quicker and easier and even more accurate in my experience of focusing with the Leica M lenses. And I can't explain why, I don't know if it's, it's just something that I find so simple and easy to do. It's not difficult at all. And with this newer M, it's really spot on. The calibration is really good. I've read a lot of stuff where diehard Leica guys still think the M10 is the best digital M. They prefer it over the M11. And I've been back and forth trying to figure that out. And maybe I'm sure some of you will let me know in the comments. I'm sure everybody has their own opinions on that, which is fine. But I think it may be, maybe because of, you know, it's the Sony sensor in the M11. There's a lot of guys that say they love the color science in the older M240s or the M262s. Kodak did the M8 and the M9. So it's all up for debate and, and taste and opinion. People have already been messaging me and asking me if I like the color science out of the M10. And 
how I feel about it working with it in post. And I love it. I love the color out of it because I was having issues with consistency in my pictures. The first month that I've had this, I've been messing with different looks and things, but now I just kind of really leave it as is. Something for me with my color blindness, I had one of my DP friends here, shout out to Whiskey and a Camera. He suggested to me, you know, Justin, why don't you just treat your digital photo cameras as if it's film in terms of the white balance. So if you think about film, you only have two flavors of, of color balance, right? You either get daylight or you get tungsten. I know that sounds like a very simple concept, but I just never tried that before. So now I just, if it's daytime and I'm outside, I just leave it on 5,000 Kelvin. If it's nighttime or indoors for tungsten, I just go the generic 3200. And if I'm in like a fluorescent setting like this place where maybe it looks a little better at 4500 because I always shoot raw guys. And that's another cool thing about having a little bit smaller resolution. The files aren't nearly as big. So with the RX1 R2, that was a 42 megapixel camera. It's amazing resolution. The file sizes are insane because I always shoot raw. So having the 24 megapixels, it's not bad. I think it's a nice happy medium. Medium. And it is a bit of a drop going from the 42 megapixels of the RX1 and then dropping down to the 24 megapixels of the M10. But I, again, I much prefer the smaller file size for just for archival purposes alone. All right, so let's talk about the low light capabilities because that was the thing that was kind of making me nervous the most before I pulled the trigger on this M10 because, you know, coming from the world of Sony's, they have really good low light capabilities. This camera though, the M10, I find it performs just as good, if not better, than the 2015 RX1R Mark II. This M10 is pretty good. Uh, these samples right here are some of my favorite. There's no noise reduction put on these. And these, I don't think any of these went beyond 2500. And if it did, it definitely did not go beyond 3200 ISO. So I think it's a pretty good performer. I was exposing for the highlights too. So, you know, it wasn't like I was trying to, you know, expose for the dark and let the highlights blow or nothing like that. So I don't know. I've been actually impressed with the low light based upon just things that I read in forums and online. It, it kind of makes you nervous reading the stuff about it. And then, but in practical use, I'm like, damn, I think it's pretty good. Yeah, so let's circle around back to that color science issue. I do much prefer using the actual M10 picture profile that you can load into Lightroom through the SD card and, and then you can save it into Lightroom. And that's what I do. So that's what I've been doing. Like at first I was trying to use these kind of weird uh, recipes for Portra 400 and stuff, but it, it just seemed really green to me and seemed it didn't really look right. And you can let me know in the comments if they looked weird or what. I mean, I still do some pretty heavy grading, but not when it comes to color. I Because again, I have a red green colorblind, so I don't mess with color at all. All I do is mess with exposure, contrast, detail, texture, things like that. I only mess with levels and curves, but no color. I don't touch any color whatsoever. For me, that's the safe way to go, again, because of the hue deficiency. Here's the one thing I will say that I'm gonna talk shit about Lightroom real quick and also Capture One. However, I do think Capture One, I saw online that people were doing a, an online petition for this, but I think it's such a disservice that these editing programs for photography don't have a vector scope. Maybe by the time this comes out, they will have won the petition and Capture One will put it. I'll tell you what, if Capture One puts a vector scope in their program, I will drop my Lightroom subscription in, in a heartbeat because that's actually how I've learned to color grade in DaVinci Resolve. I totally rely on the vector scope because then I can look at the colors in a numerical value, like in a scientific way, that's how I assess the colors because I can read a vector scope. That's how I've gotten around it in the video world. So it's just a bummer we don't have a vector scope in these, you know, professional color grading photography suites. The other thing I think is really good about this camera is the battery life. It still has the crazy quick release plate that's on the M8 and the M6. These batteries, these are good. There is some back and forth. Again, I found some discrepancies about the battery life on this camera and I thought that was really weird. However, I don't use live view. Maybe that's how I get a whole day out of one battery. I really do guys. I can go out and shoot six hour day and no problem still have battery, no problem. I mean, this is why, you know, I had this same kind of style of case on my M8 and I also have it for the M10. So maybe that's why, maybe that's how I get a better value out of the battery. I tried out the Leica Photos app uh, to do these self portraits. I, I don't care about doing self portraits, but I really just wanted to try out the Photos app because you guys know uh, from having a YouTube, I've been putting my 
my, my mug on the thumbnails for quite a while, and I've always used my photo cameras. And honestly, the Photos app is really good. It's really, really good. I was really impressed. It's easier to take pictures of myself with this camera than it is with my Sony cameras. I guess it's just impressive to me to have this rangefinder camera and you're able to take pictures of yourself uh, with the app. Now, here's something else I thought about, and this might be a fun one for any guys out there or women doing street photography and you're like six foot or taller, I have a mission for you. Get yourself a camera strap that kind of sits high, hook it up to the Photos app, and if you're tall enough, you could probably get some really cool shots and nobody would ever know because you could just walk up, your camera's sitting right here and you're on the Photos app looking at your phone and just snap away. I mean, I know you can do that on Sony cameras too, but it's just, I find it so like a novel idea that now we can do it on a rangefinder. Uh, but I'm not tall enough. I'm only 5'10". So, so I think for the tall guys and girls out there, it'd be a much fun. Please do it and make a video on it. I will subscribe to your channel and love you forever. <laughs> do keep in mind, the Leica Photos app, it, it eats up your battery pretty quickly. I will say that. So even though I mentioned earlier about my stigmatism, you know, it still makes me nervous using this camera, even though I know it has live view and you can zoom in and all that, but still something about it makes me a little nervous when doing paid work. You guys know I put my cameras to work instantly, but mainly for like lifestyle portraiture work, I just thought maybe I should pick up the Visaflex. And I got the first generation because there's a lot of debate back and forth, which one is best for the M10. I don't mind this little guy. It's actually really cool. And it's not that crazy. Like a lot of people online were like, it looks so ridiculous. It's really not that crazy to me. Here's the best part about it. It tilts. This is what I loved about the Sigma FP EVF. This has the same resolution and the same magnification as the Sigma FP, by the way. But do you notice one, it doesn't make the camera this big. It's like a third of the size and it sits on top of the camera. I just love it. I don't use it that often though, funny enough. I don't use it as much as I thought I would, but it doesn't bother me sitting there on top. If you saw any of my Leica M8 videos, you know I like to use the external viewfinders anyways. I have so many of these and shout out to Daniel. He's the guy I got the M10 from actually. And he also gave me this awesome Voltlander viewfinder. This thing is so cool. This is for 28 millimeters. I mean, I really started using the external viewfinders because of the M8s, you know, having to use wider lenses for to get a similar field of view, a full frame equivalent. But I just got hooked on it because they're so much bigger and clearer to see out of. I just love it, man. I love it. And this Voltlander one he hooked me up with, not only does it look super cool, it's really clear. So yeah, if you compare like the Visaflex, right? Like if you compare that to like a normal external viewfinder, right? It's not that much bigger. It's not really that much difference. It's just a little bump on top of your camera. And then certainly if you use these Ricoh ones, but I mean, look how big the Ricoh viewfinders are. They're really good though. So this one has frame lines for both 21 and 28. This is the one that lived on my life. Like a M8. Like, look at that bump, okay? Literally, this is pretty damn close to the same size as the Visaflex. Yeah, so check that out. They're pretty, pretty damn close, but I love that it tilts 90 degrees. That was my favorite part about the FP. That's what I love about this one. I don't lean on it as much as I thought I would. It eats up your battery because you have to have live view on. Now, here's the cool thing about this. If you are big into using EVFs and stuff, you could leave live view on, but this thing has a really good built-in sensor. And as soon as you put your eye to it, it jumps to this. And as soon as you take your eye away, it jumps back to the screen. But if you wanted to save your battery and not cause any issues, because some people online do say that that the Visaflex causes the camera to overheat or something. I've never experienced that, but again, I don't leave it on that long, right? I just use it real quick to check for framing and maybe like zoom in and get some critical focus right on my eyeball, my messed up eyeball. But then like when I'm done, I just pop it off. Like I don't leave it on, but if you wanted to leave it on, you totally could. You just tap the LV, the live view button and just kill live view and it kills power to this thing. So it is kind of cool. You have options there. I got this for less than 300 bucks. So you can get them for fairly cheap for, you know, having the Leica name on it. With the right lens, this camera is more compact than even the RX1R Mark II. Look how thin this thing is. This is the 40 mil Summicron. This has got to be one of the smallest Leica M lenses. It is so tiny. Look how thin this is. Okay, I know the RX1 cameras have the really tiny camera bodies, almost too tiny if we're being honest, but what makes those cameras bigger is they got like the little beer can lenses on the front of it, right? This is insane. This is so much easier to throw inside of a jacket. And I do that all the time. I'm always sneaking my camera into places, always have my camera with me, but you just never know. You pay all this money for a camera, don't leave it at home, right? Like I'm that type of dude. Now bouncing off of that, as you saw with that big 21 mil, you can also cause this camera to be quite cumbersome very quickly because the body is kind of slim and is very lightweight. This camera is, it's a nice build. I think I'm starting to even get some brassing on it, which is very exciting. It feels substantial, it feels nice, 
but it is very slim, right? So I think the problem is when you start putting bigger lenses on it, it just gets really cumbersome really quick. So that's why I try to avoid the really big fast lenses because it just takes the joy out of using a camera this sleek. Because even with this Voltlander 75 mil, I got this so cheap. I had to drive all the way out to the West side for this late at night to get it. This is a, and this has the hood on it. So this is actually longer than what it is. In the grand scheme of things, this is a very tiny 75 mil F 2.5 lens. So like if you are used to, you know, bigger mirrorless cameras or something. So in terms of what it is, it, it's tiny, but in terms of adding this to a rangefinder it gets kind of unyieldy rather quickly. And this camera becomes a little cumbersome, a little heavy for, you know, what it is. I just wanted to throw that out there, but I think most Leica M users know that. So now I guess we've officially entered into maybe the negative section. There's not a lot about it, but just be aware too that I do have issues using some uh, Leica thread mount adapters. So LTM lenses, that Voltlander lens I just showed you, the 75 mil, it's a Leica thread mount. I have a few Leica thread mount lenses and one of my favorite lenses that I'm gonna be reviewing quite shortly here, this really awesome Voltlander 28 mil F1.9 Ultron, but that's the first, very first version. So that one is a Leica thread mount as well. If you're wanting to use the Visaflex or even live view, you're going to have to spend the extra money to get the LTM adapters that have the actual six bit coding. Because if you don't, this camera, even if you go into the menus and tell it like the focal length it is, it doesn't matter. Live view will disengage. Therefore your Visaflex will disengage and all it will say on the screen is lens not detected. And that's because it doesn't have the six bit coding. So just be aware of that. So the last kind of negative con, you probably saw this on the YouTube shorts or over on the Instagram reels is the camera's internal spot meter. And there's been a lot of interesting comments and messages after I put those videos out. I guess people don't realize this, but every digital camera has an internal spot meter and every manufacturer designs that internal spot meter a little differently. And what I think a lot of people fail to realize that every single camera, whether it's analog or digital, because there's even some analog cameras that have internal light meters, that M6 back there, that's from 1985. That's when that specific one was put out. It has an internal spot meter. How meters work is they are metering for middle gray. That's why I say you don't always want to hit it right in the center, right? Because that's middle gray. Every meter exposes for middle gray, not for skin tones, right? So that's why I was trying to drive home in those shorts. And I think because of all the weird responses I got to those short videos makes me feel like I need to do a dedicated long form video on explaining cameras internal spot meters and how they relate to a dedicated Sekonic spot meter. So again, if you're interested in seeing a long form video like that, please let me know in the comments below so I can get an idea if it'll be worth it or not. So with all that being said, this camera in my testing consistently overexposes middle gray, consistently. So because of that, I usually ride the exposure value index in the negative. It just depends on the scene. Sometimes I'll only put it like a negative third under. Sometimes I'll drop it as low as negative one under if it's just like a big landscape shot. And that's why I test every sensor that comes into my hands. And it's not hard to do because again, I've done a full video on this, take ownership of your sensor. That sensor ownership test was taken directly out of the 11th edition of the American Society of Cinematographers manual. If you're new here, I'll leave a link to that down in the description below. So in summary, I do not miss the RX1 R Mark II. I just love the rangefinder experience. I think it connects me to the camera. If you saw my M8 review, you know, I think it really forces me to think about what I'm doing. And I think it does push me to be a, I don't wanna say better photographer, but I do think it pushes me to be a more thoughtful photographer. I'm not relying on the machine to do my job because I can't, you know, and that's what I love about it. I have this M6 now. Again, I've only had this for a couple of weeks. Now you say, why dude, why? Why are you going down this rabbit hole, Justin? So these are the big updates for dog times. I am in the process of creating a whole nother channel, a sister channel. This one will still live on. This, this channel is not gonna change much. The environment's gonna change because I'm uh, getting out of Dodge, <laughs> okay? Because the sister channel that I'm creating, it's not gonna be gear related. There's not gonna be talking heads like this. It's not gonna be glorifying camera gear. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of done with that now after this whole uh, heated debate I caused. <laughs> My wife and I are launching a new documentary series and we've already been working on it for the past couple months. I started working on it with the M8 and the RX1 actually. And why I invested in this is because the series focuses around street photography. It's, it's focused around community, 
Uh, so basically every episode is us in a new town. We started working on it already before we hit the road and we are definitely hitting the road. So we have the RV now. I just have to wrap out a couple more gaffing jobs here in LA and we're on it and we're on. But the first episode of our new series called Local Calls Photo, we locked the handle down for YouTube. We locked the handle down for Instagram. We even locked it down for Facebook and TikTok, the website too. We're just waiting to launch it. We already have tons of stuff shot for the first episode. I interview musicians of the town. So episode one is gonna be Echo Park. If you're familiar with LA, you know Echo Park's a cool little town. The interviews are, are interesting. It's a unique style, taking portraits and interviewing musicians, locals, shop owners, all people in that town, honoring that town and taking a real look at that town, the people that are in that town from a real life standpoint and not this kind of uh, glossy Instagram social media lens. You know, you guys know I embrace a very gritty style. I take a lot of inspiration from one of my favorite street photographers, which is Joel Sternfeld. And then of course I mix that with my own voice, which is kind of uh, this weird kind of grungy skate rat background that I have. And I like to embrace the grittiness. It, it's already in the work. So be on the lookout for that. Local calls photo. It's going to be pretty rad. And I thought I can't do a documentary like this, a documentary series like this and not stay true to street. So I just had to get a real film camera. And here's another crazy thing. I'm even gonna be shooting some eight millimeter for the series too. So the series is gonna be gnarly. It's gonna be a lot of fun and we plan to be on the road for anywhere from nine months to a year. So I'm stoked about it. I want you guys to be stoked about it. And you'll definitely know when the channel launches, just be on the lookout for when we do the official launch because uh, I'll be posting those updates everywhere. Okay guys, I guess that's gonna wrap it up. Let me know your thoughts what you think about this crazy, all the endeavors going on. I have something really awesome planned for you all coming up for my diehard film lovers. But someone said, hey man, I would love for you to let us know what films you feel every filmmaker and cinematographer should see. So I'm like, oh dude, I'm in. We're starting with a movie and one that really rocked my world when I was a kid. Thank you for watching. Please check and make sure you subscribe to the channel. I wanna make it to 50,000 this year. You know, that's why I'm such a slow climber because I lose subscribers because um, I seem to always, you know, upset the masses somehow, some way. And I'm not intentionally doing it. I just thought maybe people were on my channel because they were a fan of me. Or maybe I thought like they actually appreciate someone being real with them on this crazy platform for once. And well, I'm always shocked by the amount of people that let me know that that's not why they're here. But well, I hate to break it to them. I'm never gonna change, baby, because I'm 39. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you for the support, guys. We'll see you in the next one. I started feeling vapid. It kind of felt like a vacuum. Like we're all just doing, we're all shooting the same shit. Like we're all breaking into the same church. We're all putting the sticks down and we're shooting it symmetrically. And we're all, it's, the edits are different, but it's all the same photos. Uh -huh.